how the heck do you follow that? I mean, that's, that's totally insane. Oh, well, here I go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, learning to live my life out loud, I, I needed to learn to find my voice in the signs of my, my meditation. I'm an observer. You know, I watch people in nature and learn from that. And that's how I learn. I, in order for me to live my life out loud, it's, it's through who I am and what I do. I, I need to, to work from the inside out to find my truth. The thing that came up in the process were labels. You know, I was, I was a son. I was a brother. I was a cousin. I was an uncle. Now I'm a great uncle. God, who knew I'd live this long, right? I'm a friend. You know, the, these are all labels. And then once I started school, then I got more labels through the veil of judgment, the way that other people saw me. When I started school, I stuttered. And that's truth. Judgment. Okay. When I started school, I stuttered, so I was a stutterer. I'm dyslexic, so dyslexic. Things that came with dyslexia, things like stupid, retard, moron. I was also called nigger because of my skin color. Sissy boy, faggot. I was shy. I'm still shy. And I was teased about my skin color, and uh, I was a little bit effeminate. I can admit that now and be proud of it. <laughs> Own it, you know. I can... You know, I was, I, was, I, was, I was teased. I was beaten up. I mean, I was beaten up on a pretty regular basis. My, my lunch money was taken away from me, you know. And I was, I was one of those kids, you know. When I was getting beat up, I remember having this feeling and sensation that there were other kids around watching, and they didn't do anything. I mean, they could have been throwing the punches as far as I felt, you know, that they were actually throwing those punches. So in my silence, I, I, I did. I tried to commit suicide a few times, you know. I, I, but then I kind of went through that door. And I made a vow to myself that I was going to show them. I was going to get my revenge and be the very best at something. You know, little did I know that I had already started on that quest. Because at 18 months old, I started in dance and acrobatic lessons. You know, years later, I, I got involved in gym, into gymnastics. And then by the time I was eight years old, I started diving. I still suffered from low self-esteem issues. I did get involved in, in one relationship where I was raped at knife point. Um, and it was a long-term relationship. After that rape, I stayed for six years because I thought I deserved that. Because I didn't think I, I, didn't think I was worth anything, you know, that I was worthless. I did have my joys in, 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 in my life. I, hid, I did have those, you know, those bright lights. Um, I spent five weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller for my autobiography. Um, I didn't really know what that meant at the time because, uh, you know, that's not my world. But my co-author was like bouncing off the ceiling. I was like, okay, just think of it as a gold medal. You won an Olympic gold medal, you know, five <laughs> times. So, okay. <laughs> Then it registered, okay? You know, I, I received standing ovations doing a one-man show in New York City. Uh, breaking world records, uh, you know, on, on, on the world stage, at world championships, Olympic games. You know, more labels came. New York Times best-selling author, actor, best diver ever, <laughs> four-time Olympic gold medalist, you know, Olympic gold medals aren't going to keep you warm at night, but, and, and, and they're not going to pay your mortgage, right? Well, 
I'm working on it, so I'll keep this one. But I'm a firm believer that you don't achieve greatness on your own. You know, there's always somebody there. You know, for me, it was my mom. She taught me unconditional love. And then my coach, Ron O'Brien. I mean, that Olympic Games, when I hit my head on the board and getting through that time, that was incredible. I couldn't have done it without him. You know, I had all these wonderful people. When I did my one-man show, Randy Brenner, my director, I mean, he kicked my ass in that show. And, and it showed, uh, you know, my co-author, Eric Marcus, and then my, our editor, you know, Mitchell Ivers. You know, there were all these bright lights in my life. It took a, a bit of time. Uh, I took a little time out away from the limelight, and uh, I, I was kind of afraid of people. I did better with dogs, you know. I just felt more comfortable. People scared me. So uh, I became a dog trainer. I competed on a national level in dog agility uh, at the AKC Nationals, and my Jack Russell Terrier was ranked number one, and her son, who I trained, was number three in the country. So, you know, I, I, I reached a pretty high level there. But the one thing that I learned, that I took from that experience, is I learned I loved to learn about learning and creative ways of learning. I mean, being dyslexic, I had, I had to have creative ways of the way I learned. I have a learning difference. I learn differently. It's not a learning, you know, it's, it's not a disability. It's a learning difference. Um, so as far as the, the detour that I took, it was really brought me back to teaching, to teaching people and creative ways of looking at things, and creative ways of, of teaching something. So then, you know, I, I, I got more labels, you know, dog trainer, <laughs> mentor, speaker, activist, humanitarian. I thought I found forgiveness for my tormentors, forgiving the kids who beat me up, you know, my dad, who at one point took his belt off and started whipping me until I did a dive that I was too afraid to do in practice at home in my backyard pool in the winter. Um, a partner who raped and abused me physically and emotionally. And a rather heavy-handed coach who, who belittled me and threatened me. Um, in my prayers of meditation, I knew with forgiveness in my heart, I could find someplace beyond victim. And those labels of helplessness, you know, of, of victim, I mean, I had to get beyond that. And the turning point came to me when I took care of my dad, the last six weeks of his life with his battle with cancer. In diving, I always wanted my record to speak for itself. But personally, I always... I was always observant about actions, you know, and so I wanted my actions to speak louder than my words because I learned that, that so often words are empty. So when it came time to take, look after my dad, I later realized it wasn't out of love that I was looking after this man. Not at first. It was out of guilt. Being obstinate enough to show my worthiness as a human being. And then that attitude of, I'll show him my worth. I'll show him my worthiness. And I wanted the validation of being the good son. That's what I wanted. But you know what happened? Some magic happened in my meditation. In taking care of my dad, I. He, he spoke the truest words that he could ever share with me. He turned to me and he said, you know what, son, you're doing something that I could never do for you. you know, and I was, I was proud, but I was also a little sad, you know, that, that that's, that was my reality. So over time, forgiveness, like, washed over me and, and filled me full of gratitude. You know, gratitude of having the opportunity to make peace with my dad, 
you know, to, to, to mend these wounds, these, you know, these open sores, you know, that festered. And, and I truly found that I did this act out of love. You know, I, I had to examine forgiveness, you know, after that, that uh, you know, that experience, because, you know, I would say these t- word, you know, time and time again, that I forgive, I forgive, I forgive, but I didn't think I was being authentic. It was through the veil of judgment that I was moving, moving through my life. So once I realized I needed to practice getting beyond that, you know, that there's nothing that's good, it's bad, it's, it's right or wrong, it's love or hate, it's light or dark, it just is. As long as I was holding on to the good stuff, as well as the bad stuff, I was stuck. Even survivor, survivor is, is worn like a badge of honor. And once I worked through from the inside out, I had to work from the outside in. Through the work that I did, I learned to forgive my rapist because as long as I thought of myself as a victim or even a survivor, I was empowering that person. It was just an event that happened. It just happened. A virus, HIV, AIDS. I've been diagnosed uh, 25, six years now. Um, You know what? I learned that it's not good it's bad or bad. It just is, you know? I have good days and bad days, but now I realize, I mean, they're just days. You know, I just have days. And my working from the outside in, once I passed through that veil of judgment, what I found was love, just love. You know, my practice today is to use my voice and and live out loud through my truth. I practice choosing my words choosing words of encouragement, you know, thoughts that support. By practicing this, I find that I can make a difference, and and the world shifts around me, making the place and time and space better because I'm here. I work to be independent of the good opinion of others because validation, without validation, you know, without the need for validation. That is true freedom. You're free to be who you are, that authentic being within yourself. My higher power knows who I am and what I do, you know, and that's enough for me. You know, I don't need the validation. For me to learn to love like my higher power, that's my goal, that's what I strive for. And I find that if I act out of love, I'm always better for it. Thank you. I'll pick up the cards. <laughs>